You guys remember Darren would say that he would stop and say, it depends on the crowd how far we can go. What that means is, like, you can feel in the atmosphere, like, when people have resistance, for sure. You know, all of you have had, you've driven in Houston, so I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, or, like, when people check out. So, literally, when we're in this dance together, and this has so far been so easy because, which I feel like it'll be like this on Saturdays because people aren't, um, they come for different reasons often than just feeling obligated to be, you know, the family or whatever. Um, so, wake yourself up. Literally, I mean it. If you need to stand up while he's talking and just, rock, that's, you know, to hear, do that. Like, the positioning of this part of you to, to just drink it in. What is so exciting to me about today, just all of it's been part of the whole. And so many different elements. So diverse and so beautiful all together. So take a big breath. Get ready to drink deeper. And we have Jared Allen. Come in. Uh, all right. Hello. Hello. All right, all right, all right. Here's what we're going to do today. <laughs> Matthew McConaughey. Okay, so you guys ready to take off? Yeah. yeah let's do it. Okay, so it, it's interesting as always with these three days or days like today, how the messages are different perspectives of many of the same ideas. If you're listening, you're going to notice an interweaving of some things that's... And you know, here's the interesting thing. We don't talk. It's not like we get together and put our heads together and say, okay, I'll talk about this part of it. You talk about this part of it, this, that, other. It never happens that way. It's just sort of like God just pulls it together and it never ceases to amaze me um, until I preach and then I realize, huh, God, I'm out of sync with everybody. I'm kidding. <clears throat> so um, how many of you all got to do the bowls today? The bowls? Yeah. I don't recommend them. I'm kidding. I, um, a little bit of experience. I, I was a little bit out of it during lunch, and it's taken me uh, a while to get my trauma choked back down to where I can start to communicate again. Um, it, it was weird because, I mean, it was a 30-minute session, but I, I, I sunk down into this deeper place, and then it was over, and Trista says, okay, you can get up now. And it was like I was, uh, Daryl gave me the metaphor, it's like I'm swimming back to the surface to try to come to. I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't asleep. It was just the, the depths of which I had went down into. And I woke up with my feelings hurt. Yes, my feelings were hurt. No, it was, I don't know. You know, here, here's, here's some, I mean, my, my hypothesis on that is, you know, we have, we have trauma memory stored yeah. in our body, yeah. you know what I mean, in our nervous system. And if you go into the subconscious like that, what a lot of times will merge is that stuff. I mean, I used to, before I was more healed, um, I used to could not take naps because when I woke up from a nap, I would be angry, and I would be, my, my, my emotions would be really f raw, and uh, I finally, one day, I asked God, I said, God, what is that? Because I know it's not just waking up in a bad mood. There's something there. I'm, I'm experiencing something, and so the way I understood it was, you know, when we're walking around in our day-to-day, -day, it's kind of like our defense mechanisms are able to shove that crap down where it belongs. <laughs> you know, keep that stuff. But when you go to sleep, sometimes your, your, your defense mechanisms are going into those kind of meditative states. Your defense mechanisms sort of sleep or they weaken, and stuff starts to emerge into consciousness, and then you're experiencing the emotion as if though you're in it, and you have no memory in terms of what the event was, but you're experiencing the emotion as it was the event. Anyways, I think that was my experience today. And it was weird because my feelings was hurt, but I was so apathetic about it, I don't care. <laughs> I was telling Tammy on the way back from lunch, it's like, I just want to give up. 
I want to quit. I'm done. I had to choke it down. That's not my message. Um, that's a side note. Uh, <laughs> does anybody here have a message Bible with them? Are y'all real charismatics or what? Jesus. Nobody has a message Bible. All right, give it to me on your phone. I'll, t- I'll take the phone then. I want Hebrews chapter 5-ish. We'll start there. And I'm going to read this, and I might get to this. Is that, is that message? Or is that uh, passion? Oh, message. I want, I want, pa- I want passion. Did I say message? Oh, my bad. Pas- passion. Okay, thank you. All right, all right. So I'm going to read it, and I might get to it. You know, we've got to read Scripture to make them legal, right? As Darren used to say, let's make it legal. Okay, so for every high priest was chosen from among the people and appointed to represent them before God by presenting their gifts to God and offer sacrifice on their behalf. I, I don't want all that, but I can't tell you where I want. I want verse 7, please, because y'all don't want to hear all that. Y'all want to read all that. Okay, during Christ's days on the earth, he pleaded with God, praying with passion and with tearful agony that God would spare him from death. God, that sounds very human, doesn't it? And because of his perfect devotion, his prayer was answered. His prayer was answered? Does that not raise a question for you? Okay. His prayer was answered and he was delivered. Next, next verse. But even though he was a wonderful son, I'm sure he was, he, listened to, he, he, he learned to listen and obey through all his sufferings. Next verse. And after being proven perfect in this way, he was now become the source of eternal salvation to all those who listen to him and obey. Next verse. For God has designated him as the king priest who is over the priestly order of Melchizedek. We have much to say about this topic, although it is difficult to explain because you have become dull and sluggish to understand. Man, y'all think we're hard. Paul was, or maybe not Paul, we don't know. For you should already be professors instructing others by now, but instead you need to be taught from the beginning the basics of God's prophetic oracles. You're like children still needing milk and not yet ready to digest solid food. For every spiritual infant who lives on milk is not yet pierced, I love this, is not yet pierced by the revelation of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature whose spiritual senses perceive heavenly matters. And they have been adequately trained by what, they're, what they've experienced. This goes back to Nate's experience. To emerge with understanding of the difference between what is truly excellent and what is evil and harmful, or in the New King James it says, to be able to discern good and evil. Okay, thank you for that. So, what I, the, here's my plan. We'll see if this works. The plan is to give a broader overview, a broader layer, let's say, a, 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 an expanded long view, and then to keep going down in layers to hopefully more practical. Tammy's going to help me with the practical part of that, okay? So, so we're going to take this in layers, and if this goes right, well, we'll all be surprised. Okay, here we go. So what I want to offer you, this is the long view, this is the, the, the bigger, you know, the big story, is I want to offer you an alternative biblical narrative. See, we've all been told in our religious traditions, our spiritual traditions, our Christian tradition, what the big idea is, right? We've, we've, and it always starts in the garden. And so here, here's in a nutshell what the, what the traditional biblical narrative is. God 
created humans in a perfect state, in a perfect environment, with a talking snake, <laughs> known as the devil, otherwise. And they listened to the talking snake, the serpent, and they ate of the wrong tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And through that eating of the tree, um, depending on what your theolo theological persuasions are, determining how angry God was and all that stuff. But, what, but according to our biblical, traditional biblical narrative is, man's eyes were opened and they were separated from God. Humanity was separated from God and there's this emotional, psychological, and spiritual gulf between God and man, and they were kicked out of the garden. Therefore, we needed Jesus to come to redeem man back so that God could love us again or somehow give us a position back into relationship. Does that seem about right? Did I miss anything? That seems pretty close as far as a nutshell goes. That's not how I see it. I don't think that's the way things work. Now, I, whether you believe the garden story is a literal story about literal people, I don't have an axe to grind with you. I don't care, really. That's, it's, I mean, it's helpful sometimes in my preaching to treat it as literal because it goes good with my message. <laughs> but if you were to ask me and try to nail me down, what is the story, I would say... It is a story of human, the, the, the beginning stage of human transformation and consciousness that was realized in Christ. So, so what, I would, what I'm trying to say in that is rather than man being up here in the pinnacle in this perfect state with God and fail from grace because of their disobedience, I don't think that's what happened at all. I think the fall is actually the point when humanity became self-conscious. Yeah. We fell. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to explain some of that, I hope. And, and, and then I want to point out along the way where we can track this in Scripture. We can track progression. We can track that humanity was moving in a trajectory that God was pulling forward, that God was actually involved in bringing man to a new state of consciousness. And I would even tell y'all this. I'm not the first to say this. Darren was the first to say it, and it blew my mind. We don't have the same consciousness that people that we're reading about had. We are reading back into history thinking they're exactly like us. But consciousness or humans' development within consciousness, I should say, has never been a static situation, nor is it now. So, you know, and I would even take it a bit further. You know, the big question for us now is where is this going? <laughs> right? I mean, it's like, it's not done. Anyways, I should check my notes. I made some, man, I made some great notes. And uh, there's two problems. If I try to follow them closely, you won't get the best of me. But if I don't follow them, you're not going to get the best, best message. So we have, we have a dilemma. So what I'm saying is, is to kind of reiterate what I'm saying is, Adam wasn't the pin pinnacle point. He's the starting point of a trajectory. Right? So that's what I mean by a different narrative. Religion never taught me that. I only started seeing that when God spoke to me one time and he says, you know, because I, here I was, and I know I've told you all this story, but I'll tell it for those who haven't heard it. I was, I was meditating one day and I had like in my imagination this open vision of time. It was like a timeline in time. And, and, and God was, because here I am, I'm thinking about, you know, Man, we need to get back to the good old days back when, you know, we need to have a revival so we can have, you know, back when life was more pure and people were more godly and we had values and all these different things. I'm thinking that. And, and, and then God says, there's never been a generation like that. 
And he told me, he said, I'm not back there. I'm the one pulling everything forward. You're trying to go back to an old state of consciousness that we are no longer at. And so that just like, I mean, I didn't use that language. That wasn't things I was thinking about, consciousness, those kinds of things. You know, that's a neuroscience term or, you know, or, you know, spiritual term in, in a lot of circles now because we, we talk about it. But, th- but the idea was that God is the one who is advancing things. Here I was trying to get away from things being so liberal. You know, understand what I'm saying? And, and you've got to understand that as humanity is progressing through stages of consciousness, there is things that are happening within us that, that make our social dynamics and our show, social systems different because we're different. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So as we change and progress, so is our environment changing and the way we deal with each other changing. See, there was a time, if you go back into into Bible, you know, those old days, it was nothing to slaughter people. Genocide was like that, man. It was so common among the people, they thought, they never thought twice about it. And so we think about that today. If one country like Russia invades Ukraine, we're we're changing our Facebook profiles to the Ukraine flag. Bless God, you know why? Because we're against it. And we should be. Why? Because something in us tells us that's not right. If we were back in Bible times, we'd think, well, that's an everyday deal. How did we get there? And, you know, if you think about it, you read in Scripture and you read a lot of a lot of different portions of Scripture that seem so unevolved, barbaric. Why do you think that now? Why do you sit here in, in 2022, I almost said 19, boy, no. In 2022, how, how is it you can sit here in 2022, look at that and go, that's barbaric, and know it's barbaric, and have trouble reconciling that in your mind? Because you're not the same stage of consciousness. I'm glad you can't, that you look at that, read that in scriptures. Even those things in which they said God said do them. I'm glad you can look at those and go, Phew, I'm not sure I know that God. It's because you don't. That was their God. Anyways, we'll get there. I kind of get ahead of myself. See, that's why these notes ain't no good. <laughs> and then I get lost and I get confused. And then, then that's all you get. Okay, so when I say a metaphor for human consciousness, I want you to now think about the garden narrative, which would read something like this. And the serpent was the more cunning than all the animals of the field. And he came to the woman and said, did God really say you can't eat of all the trees? And she said, no, no, I can eat of all the trees. I just can't even touch that one. Oh, like, you know, so I'm not going to go into all that. So you you know the story, right? So I want you to picture that. And instead of picturing a scene where this is playing out in real time, like, you know, us sitting here and doing different, and there's there's Tammy there, there's Heather there, and and Karuna there, and so we're all these in Monica, and so we're kind of like engaging. I want you to start to look at the components of the garden as aspects of the human psychological and emotional and spiritual components. So I'm asking you to treat it like a metaphor or a parable. So, so I want to try to understand it from that position to some extent because I want us to, to, I want to offer a different narrative. You don't have to agree with it. I'm not asking you to agree. I don't even ask you to like it or any of that. I would never do that. All I would want to do, and this is what I love about coming here, is because I get to say things here that I would never say in another church. That says something about y'all as much as anything, that you would be willing to listen without getting so triggered that you're going to run out the door. We all know what it feels like when somebody teaches something we absolutely disagree with. We get triggered emotionally. Usually some form of anger or you know, anxiety triggers in your system. Just manage that. That's just the, the amygdala getting triggered because when our thoughts and ideas are uh, in any way challenged, it feels like a threat to us. I'm not threatening you. I'm just offering an idea. I am not. I may be wrong. But I just want to cause you to think, okay? That's, that's where I'm coming. That's my heart in the matter, okay? So some of the key ideas is Eden. Eden means pleasure, as you all know. Sheila's taught this very well. It means pleasure. It means the, it means the idea that, that 
when man is created, it's, he's created in the pleasure of God, that God actually likes you. God's a bit of a pleasure seeker. I'll just be honest with you. He likes, he likes you. He likes, he likes enjoying you. So Eden would represent, would represent sort of the, the atmosphere and the heart in which you were designed. The garden, it says the garden is in Eden. So this is a deeper component. This is a place. So what I would say in, in the metaphorical sense is, is that represents the deeper space in which is in you. This, is, this may be the part where I was going earlier when I was trying to swim back up to the surface. Maybe, maybe the deeper, this is where fellowship with the, the divine happens within the human spirit. So it's trying to communicate that there is, a, there, is a, there is a union that happens in the place of the garden. You have a garden within you. It's just a way of talking about there's, there's a divine connection. There is a, there is a, there is the Christ self is there. The higher self is in there. And so then you have man and woman. Ish and Isha in, in, the, in the Hebrew. And to me, and this is an, an interesting thing that I don't have a lot of revelation on, but I, I understand enough in psychology to know that, men, that everybody has, has feminine and masculine energy, that there are elements of that balance within everybody. You've all seen men who had more of a, a feminine energy to them than, a, than, than maybe other men, or men who are overly balanced and masculine, or you've seen women who were very masculine. They had a femininity. I'm not saying they were, you know, not feminine, but they had a masculine energy. And, and if you've ever engaged with people with those energies, you can feel it. You know it's a different. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying within the component of humans, there is that male and female, that ma not male and female, because that says, suggests gender. It's masculine and feminine. It has nothing to do with body parts. Right. Right. And I want you to understand, it has nothing to do with, you know, with, with whether it's a physical part. It's not. It has to do with how we manage our energy. It's been told to me, I don't believe a dang word of it, that I have a feminine energy. I went to, um, I don't know, sorry, this is kind of a story. We went to Destin. We, we met at Destin for, you know, with Sheila and the group of people. And, and we walked into one of these uh, crystal stores, maybe. You know, it has all these different things and stuff. And we just went in to kind of see what was up. And so we walk in, and instantly this lady starts reading us. She said she was a shaman, and I cracked a joke. I said, what school you got to go to to graduate as a shaman? And so she kind of chuckled, and she started talking, and she goes, you have a, a feminine energy as a man. As a man. Like, like, it's like, what? No, I'm kidding. I don't know how we got there. I don't think she just busted out with that. She didn't start with that, but we were, she was reading, and we kind of got there. And she, was, she was asking me what I did. She says, do you work with energy? And I said, well, I'm a therapist, so yeah, I work with energy every day. That's, that's pretty much what I'm doing, It's working with energy. Yeah, and so she starts talking to me about managing that energy that I'm experiencing, and then she goes on to say that you're in the right profession because you have, like, a, a lot of feminine energy. And uh, anyways, it was embarrassing. I'm glad nobody else was there, but here I'm telling everybody. But, and, so, and so I got to thinking about it. But here's what she told me, though. She told me an interesting thing, whether I could believe her or not. Well, she told me a couple things. She says, don't wear black because it's, it's attracting negative energy, but as I, I don't listen. And then uh, she said, you know, you should work. Yeah. <laughs> nice to be the butt of the joke. <laughs> so um, where was I? Um, she told me don't wear black. Oh, don't wear black because it's, you know, but anyways. Um, oh, she, oh, gosh, this is all personal. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. So she told me to work toward balancing that energy. She said, I can tell you're, you're a muscular guy. You have very masculine features. You know, you're very attractive and probably, you know, extremely good in bed and stuff and all that. <laughs> no, all that's, that's not true. She didn't say any of that. But she did say, I can tell you, you you're, you're muscled, you're masculine. I get that. She said, but, you know, your, your energy is that way. And then she told Tammy she was masculine. I was like, ah, you the man. 
I said, yeah, she tries to wear the pants, but I don't. I do. Anyways, I'm just kidding. But, but what I'm trying to say is, is, so if we look at this in a metaphorical sense, that, and maybe this is some, I don't, I mean, listen, I'm not trying to make some doctrine here, but maybe that's some of the confusion sometimes with, you know, with who we are in some ways is because our energies are, are, are off or whatever, and maybe, I, I don't know any of that to be true. Nothing as far as research goes. Um, okay, the two trees represents the source in which, as Sheila teaches, the source that we draw from, how, what we live from. And we know those to be the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. We can draw from one of those two trees and we will, we will bear the fruit of the trees that we, that we eat. And then the serpent, we like to call the devil, but I, if I look within myself, I know the true devil usually is my ego. It is the thing that brings adversity to my life. It is the thing that tries to connect me more than anything to the wrong tree. And it's very subtle, and oftentimes you won't even know when you're functioning in ego because it's so subtle. Okay? So that's how I, I kind of understand the serpent. So, I mean, I'm not trying to take your devil away. If you want to believe in the devil, that's fine. I don't necessarily not believe in the devil. I don't know what I think about the devil, but, but in, in this particular metaphor, how I'm understanding this as a component within ourselves is one of the things that we're being conscious and aware of is how our ego comes into play. And a lot of times we think of ego as being, yeah, it's all prideful, you know, and all that stuff. That's not what ego is. Ego is all about survival. The one thing that ego wants the most is to survive, and it will do anything to survive. So if it, it reads criticism from others as a threat to their survival, it will fight you. You see what I'm saying? It could be any minor thing that feels like a threat. The ego is going to rise up, take over, and start to, to fight. And you know, and, and resist that. So what I'm saying is, is there's a resistant component within, within humanity that we have to become aware of. Make sense? And then, of course, the last component was the voice. It says that they were afraid because they heard the voice in the cool of the day walking in the garden, and it created a separation inside. So the voice represents the higher self, the part of you, the Christ within that is in union with humanity. The, 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 the Christ consciousness, if you will, that is within us. So there's that, that component, the, the voice. So I'm, I'm throwing that out to try to help us understand this from a different frame. And so in the story, and maybe I just flip back and forth here, in the story it says that when they ate of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was always interesting to me that God has a conversation within the Trinity. He says, they say that they have now eaten of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the, the fruit, and their eyes have now been opened and they're just like us. Isn't that the point? Like, wasn't that all? I mean, okay. As Darren would always say, I might not be a smart man. <laughs> but wasn't that always the point? To be, I mean, if we think about it, well, I'm trying to be like Christ. I'm trying to be like Jesus. I'm trying to be like God. Well, you're already. I mean, if, if you follow after Adam, your eyes are open. And, and yet you know good from evil. So, we, so in that, we're talking about, yeah, that's, that's where, you know, the duality in our thinking happened. That's where the polarities are now happening. We're not a unity consciousness anymore. We're not, we're not, we don't think in terms of, of oneness or collective together. We now think in terms of, of, of fragmentation or polarization. And, and so their eyes were open, but open to what? If you noticed, they noticed themselves. We be naked. And they instantly was afraid and ashamed. And so they try to hide themselves and sow fig leaves to cover themselves. And God, the voice, the higher self, says, where are you, man? And they say, well, we're afraid. 
Because we were now, so what I'm saying to you is, is when they partook of that source within themselves, they became self-conscious. But what I'm saying to you, instead of looking at this as God created the garden, perfect people in a perfect state, and going, this is what I'm going to do, as uh, John Crowder always says, that God's purpose was to create some people and hang out with naked vegans. <laughs> in the garden. That was never the plan. But that's what we're taught in in religion is that that was God's plan was to hang out with Adam and Eve. That was what his intention was. But, But man screwed it up. And so Jesus actually is plan B of a rescue mission. That's not my narrative here. My narrative is, is Christ has always been the point has always been the plan, the blueprint, not Adam. Adam was not perfect. Adam was just innocent because he didn't know. But once his eyes became open, he knew, which was an important part of the evolution of consciousness. I'm telling you, it has to happen. They now know like God knows. An important piece. And so, so what we see is then, then God has a plan and all that. So self, self-consciousness brings about some problems. One of the problems that self-consciousness brought <clears throat> was it grounded them in their physical senses. The, the physical senses grounded them into a three-dimensional reality. Spirit would be more fifth dimension or more. Third dimension is our human physical experience. And, 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 and this, this opening of the eyes grounded them in this dimension where it became difficult. As Nate was talking earlier, where they're, where they're their, their, hard, their hardness of their heart and dull of conscience and, and, all, and, and, and you know, they won't, they, won't listen to, they won't listen to the voice because of that separation that has happened. And they're grounded in such their physical senses that the only thing that can emerge is unbelief. Okay. Another thing that happened, which is clear, I won't, I won't go into these very deeply. Negative emotions emerged in self-consciousness. Fear, anxiety, shame, that feeling of separation, the actual illusion of separation. See, I want you to think about something for a second. I don't want to get too off base here, but when you ground to a 3D, a three-dimensional reality, which is solid, it's dense, it's physical, and the five physical senses are what helps us navigate in in that dimension. In other words, if I was blind and deaf, I would have a hard time navigating my physical environment. It's my senses that give me information that allow me to be able to navigate this physical world, okay? And and in in that three-dimensional is is space-time. Space-time is the Newtonian physics of cause and effect. So if... Someone says, hey, you're wanted in the foyer out there. Space-time says, I've got to walk from here to the foyer. And in order to do that, from this part of me to change to the part of me that's out there, which is one person, um, I, it's going to take time, distance, of course. I feel a cough coming on, guys, and it's not going to be pretty. <clears throat> it's going to be loud. It's going to take some effort to get there, but it is that three-dimensional way in which we have to function in this environment. So in Newtonian f- physics, if you know the density of something, if you know the velocity and the distance in which it is traveling and how quickly it's traveling, you can, you can accurately predict when that object will arrive. That's the density of this world. When their eyes became open, they became grounded in this 3D dimension. Okay? 
fifth dimension is actually the opposite of that. It's not space-time, it's time-space. And it's beyond the senses because it's in the quantum level <clears throat> of things. I'll get into that. Remind me, I'll get into that. I'll teach you some things about that. That'll be interesting, won't it? I'll, I'll get you there. Okay, I'm sidetracked. I told you these notes would keep me. So with, with, with the emergence of self-consciousness comes, besides the illusion of separation, it caused them to externalize everything. So, so God, instead of being in here, they began to externalize God out there. And so once they externalize God out there, with all that fear, anxiety, shame, now they project their emotional state onto God, assuming God is that way. So now they're experiencing a creation of their own. And so they're projecting all that's within them onto God, separate from them, and they're experiencing that reality because they created it. So what you'll notice in Scripture, now I want you to understand this, a lot of times what you're experiencing in Scripture, gracias, my friend, amigo, I should say. Amiga, is it? Amiga. I knew that. I already had one, though. <clears throat> so if, if you'll notice in Scripture, God sounds like a horrible sometimes, like, that's hard to... Reconcile your mind around some of that, those concepts, right? What do you think you're dealing with? You're dealing with Adam's monster God. You're dealing, you're dealing with a projection of humanity's self-consciousness onto this externalized God, right? So the self-consciousness brought this on. So I'm, I'm just trying to break down this, okay? So... All religions emerge from this anxiety. So one of the, okay, so let me explain. So when humans become conscious of themselves, one of the things they become conscious of is non-permanence, meaning the cycle of birth and death. And when a person becomes aware of that process, that there is loss and that there, there, there is a, a, an uncertainty, they become highly anxious. And with that comes mechanisms to try to control the fear. One of the ways you control the fear of loss like that and non-permanence, meaning I'm, I'm, I'm going to die, one of the ways you, you, you control it is through religion. So you create a system that I can control my own fear. Wow. So what you'll notice what emerges in humanity almost instantly is the need for atonement and appeasement. Why? <clears throat> because within the makeup of humanity is a thing called the conscience, not consciousness, the conscience, which tells us that we're bad yeah. or good. And the only way to appease that is to create a ritual with this externalized God that we've created that we do things to make sure we're safe because that's the only way I can do something with this anxiety. All religion in Scripture, including our own, tries to handle this angry God in this way. So with self-conscious comes this mechanism of anxiety that functions within us that we have to do something about. Not only that, what you'll start to see emerge in society and cultures, and this has been studied in humanities, in the humanities, in, in the tracing of human culture throughout time, is that there is a mechanism within culture that guilt will begin to build for a group of people. Let's say we were one tribe, and, and let's say that we're still stuck in that, that, that self-conscious mode and that God is externalized and he's angry. We start to feel that sense of, of shame and guilt. It'll build to a point that the only way to release that socially is to find a scapegoat. Someone who is guilty that we can, that we can release 
that emotional negativity onto that person so that as a group, we feel relieved. We still scapegoat all the time. But understand it is a human, it's a human function to relieve our own emotional negativity. Does that make sense? All right. But all of it is necessary. Let me tell you why. Well, I've been telling you why. The Bible says in Genesis, let us make man in our image. When did that happen? We think, well, well, what I was taught is when God made man in the garden, that was his image, was it? That was the starting point of a process that he would take humanity through that would culminate in the person Christ. We were never meant to be in the image of Adam. We were always meant to be in the image of Christ. And that was going to be a process and a progression that he would take humanity through to the point where in the fullness of time... Why did he say... Excuse me. Why did Paul say that you are now therefore new creatures? What the heck does he mean by that? That sounds good. He means that you are a new species, a new consciousness on the planet. How did that happen? It culminated in the person of Christ. So the garden story, let us make man in our image, had to begin with Adam's quote-unquote fall from grace. It's not a fall from grace as if though he was in perfection and then fell to some sort of imperfection. No. It was a fall from grace when when his eyes opened and he saw himself. And that was an important component to the trajectory we were going. Had to happen. You can see why this isn't popular because it's not, you know, it's not what people may want to hear, but, but it, it feels true to me. Yeah. So let's keep going. Let's keep going. So, so the way I read scriptures is scriptures, if you, if, you, if you look at it, is a recorded account of humanity's prog- progressive development through their revelation of God. It is a progressive revelation of, of their understanding of God. It's been and still is ever-evolving process. God, therefore, is never captured in a definition. That's constructs. I I told y'all this the last time I, I taught. Man, this is not popular. I love the church fathers. You know the ones we read, Origen, Athanasius, uh, Polycarp, uh, Gregory of Nazianza, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, all those guys. Man, such great <clears throat> theology, but they're constructs. And if you camp out at a construct and you worship a construct or become a fundamentalist to a construct, you nail yourself down to where you can't, tr- you can't continue to progress. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to do that. I'm not saying throw baby out with the bathwater and just be trying to change for the sake of change. But what I am saying is, is when you have an open space that you're willing to, to consider different ideas and are willing to allow God to, to, to challenge your thinking because you're not nailed down to a theology or a doctrine, you understand that's from Adam's monster God perspective. That is self-consciousness. That is human's in their fallen state, if you will. Don't get caught up in the religion of this. This thing is deeper than that. It's beyond that. I still engage with theology. I love theology, but I understand it's a human product. Which is, I I don't like it when people start throwing around like, oh, you're a heretic because you're not orthodox. Orthodox to a group of people who said this is the right way. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I'm not orthodox. I'm not. Mm-hmm. 
I'm not trying to be. I'm really not. Or as you can tell. I don't know where I was at. Okay, so, so let's talk about the progression. You're saying, okay, so if, if the Bible is an inspired, recorded history of the progression of people updating and their understanding of the divine, can we see that in Scripture? Here's one for you. If you read early in Scripture, Exodus, Leviticus, well, shoot, most of it, until you get to the prophets. Most of that, there is a concept called polytheism. There is the belief that there are many different gods. I mean, you read it right there in Scripture where they believe there's another god. They just progress to the point of what is called monology. Excuse me, monolatry. Monolatry means, yes, there are other gods, but we have the most high God. You've seen that in Scripture, right? The most high God. Why does they say the most high God? Because they believed there were other gods. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to say that. You'd just say God. So we see a trajectory in the Scripture where they, they move from polytheism to a place of monolatry, and later, you, I think it's probably after, if I had to guess, the Babylonian exile, a shift into monotheism where they only believed in one God. That is a, 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 a progress in them updating how they thought about the divine. How did that happen? God was meeting them where they were at, allowing them to believe what they believe, and was working with them, progressing them, moving them forward, moving them forward. I don't know why it takes so long. It's, it's us. We're the slow developers here. And God is, is meeting them, pulling them forward through history to an updated way of understanding the divine. Right? I, I know I've... This is interesting. Here's some ideas. I want you to think about this. When you read in Scripture, and this is and, and not just Scripture, actually, if you, if, you, if you study anthropology in different people groups and how they worship, number one, they all worshiped. To be human is to worship something, right? That was the nature of humans. It's a part of the makeup. It's a part of who we are, right? We're going to be worshiping something. So... Here are some things to consider, and, this is, and I'm going to track this progression. Where is God located? So the people, of, the people on the earth were going, where's our God located? And then what do we need to sacrifice? What does he want? That's always the question, because within the makeup of, of the fallen mind is the idea for appeasement and atonement. I need appeasement and I need atonement. Something's got to make us feel better. So that mechanism is in place. And God allowed them to use that mechanism until they got to a place. And then, here's the thing. In all worship, they always mutilated themselves. You read in Scripture where the Babylon, where the, where the, excuse me, the, the prophets of Baal are crying out to their God and they're cutting themselves. They're trying to manipulate their God to do something. Here we are in a battle with Elijah, who, who, whose God is Yahweh, and our God is Baal, and so they're, they're cutting themselves and, and crying out to the God because they're trying to manipulate it. So there was, there was this idea of sacrifice, and then I have, to, I have to do something to myself so that there's a proof that I'm serious. So there was a need for mutilation. It's all throughout these tribes, man. People driving holes in their ears and spikes through their lips. You've seen these people's got these long sticks hanging out their lips. You know, that's a part of their, their tradition of mutilation, appeasing the gods, so to speak. It could be fashion. I don't know, some of it. So, so what I'm saying is, is those are the questions. Where is God located? What sacrifice does he need? And what do I need to mutilate? With Abraham, God was up. Where is God located? He's the sky God. He's up there. 
because he worshipped the sun and the moon. That was his concept, right? The, the, the elements that were up there. He also thought God was up there. Even though he was hearing a voice, he understood God to be up there. What does God demand? My son. He demands my children. Which is what's interesting about that story when God interrupts him. Actually, God told him, go, go kill your son. Go offer your son Isaac, your only son. And so he, he goes up, and y'all know the story. He goes up the mountain. He brings all the wood. He's going to, Isaac's going, Dad, where's the sacrifice? Don't worry about it. He's tying him up to the, to the altar or whatever. Maybe he's just laying there or whatever. He's trusting his father. And Abraham draws the, the, the knife back, and he's going to kill him. And God stops him and goes, no. I will provide for myself the sacrifice. And there was a ram in the thicket. What is he trying to say in that? He's saying, I will never ask you like the other nations do to sacrifice your children. Your sacrifice does not have to go that far. And it was a moment of grace where he allowed humanity in that moment to update their thinking where they knew they didn't have to give their children up to appease this God. He was not that dude. Because the other tribes were doing just that. They're carrying the virgins up in the volcanoes and dropping them. Sorry about you. <laughs> right? To make sure the gods weren't angry at them. And they didn't know. You guys have heard me say this before. I know this is kind of old hash maybe. But, but their understanding of the elements was not scientific. They, they, they literally thought they affected whether the rain came and gave them crops or whether there was drought that came. They thought if something bad happened, the locusts came in, that, that someone in the camp sinned, and we need to figure this thing out. So they kept up in the ante for how much they would sacrifice to the point of what's the greatest you can sacrifice? What hurts the most? Your firstborn or, <clears throat> or, your, or your virgin daughter or, or something, right? So it's like it, there is no end to this until God steps in with humanity's consciousness and says, no, I will never want that again. Which is why I don't think God was a cosmic child abuser. If he's going to stop Abraham for it, why would he now become... If he, if he, says, if he, tells, if he tells Jeremiah, I'm judging Israel because they sacrificed their children in the fires of Moloch, mm. yep. then he needs to judge himself for sacrificing his children in the fires of hell. Yeah. Like, right? No double standard here. I know that hurt. Yeah, that didn't sit well. But that's just the point. I don't think that's the God we're dealing with. Okay. Moses, where is God located? God is in a tent, in a tabernacle. That's where God abides. That's where his presence is, is in a tent. What does he want? Just an animal. Just one animal once a year to appease the state of consciousness they were in. What kind of mutilation shall we give? This goes back to Abraham. What mutilation does he want? Does he want us to cut, <clears throat> cut ourselves? Does he want us to harm ourselves like the other tribes are doing, cut ourselves to the point we're bleeding out? No, one mutilation. And that's when circumcision was instituted. They had to have a mutilation because in their mindset, it's required still. So God allowed them to have that one mutilation and don't cut yourself anymore. Preserving them. Think about that. That's all a progression. So what you're going to notice is every step of the way, God's stepping in and being graceful to them, more loving to them, more inclusive for them, a way out of being like all the others are doing in, the, in this extreme way of trying to control the gods. David, and we know David didn't build the temple, but God was in the temple. What was the sacrifice required? Again, one animal a year. What was the mutilation? Circumcision. Then we see the progression keep going, and all of a sudden Jesus shows up. Where is God? God is in a man, a particular man the Son of God. That's where God's at. 
What, mutil- what mutilation would he need? Or what sacrifice, I should say. <coughs> Sorry. What, what sacrifice would he need? One time for all. One sacrifice that would end all sacrifices, period. Humanity would no longer have within their conscience the need to appease and atone for the negativity in the way that they had done before. An update had happened where now this one sacrifice allowed for a shift in consciousness. We don't sacrifice bulls and goats anymore. We don't sacrifice you know, anything in, in regards to that. We now look to the one sacrifice to end them all. All of humanity changed at that point, guys. We started to see that the way God was approached never turned back, and we have been progressing and updating and relating to this God through the person of Jesus. What mutilation does he require? Zero. But, not that's, but that's not it. Sounds like an info commercial, right? But that's not it. Paul moves us even further from Jesus. It starts with Jesus and he begins to move us further. Paul says, where's God? He's in you all. Mm-hmm. He's not just in a man. He's in all men, all humans. What sacrifice does he want? Zero. What? We've gone from needing children to zero sacrifices. What mutilation do we need? Zero. So, so what I'm telling you is, is if you, if you start to view it from this lens or start to at least consider it, you will see that there's a progression that's happening that starts from the garden all the way to the point of Christ. <clears throat> That our, that, our, that our perception, our consciousness, how we understand and interact with the divine has so radically changed from, from those times past until this point. Like, we are totally different in comparison. In fact, some of the things I said today would have gotten me killed. Holy smokes, I ran out of notes. I gotta quit. So, so now I'm going to take it. A, I'm going to try to take it a, a, a level deeper, okay? And this goes back to the Hebrew scriptures I, I read, or yeah, read. So it talks about Jesus, that Jesus overcame death, and that he. It says that he. Um, what was it? Learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Now, how we hear that is, that's right, God gives the command, you obey. But that's not what the word obedience means. Obedience has the the idea that you are submitting to what you're hearing. It's a way of functioning. It's a, way, it's a way of directing our life. It's not like I need words written on a book or, or, or on tablets, physical tablets, for me to read to know what to do. What he's saying is you are hearing and then you are submitting under what you are hearing. So it's not like Jesus was rebellious and he learned obedience through the things he suffered because God had to make him suffer in order for him to get his act together. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that in the midst of the difficult time, what he was able to um, develop was his ability to hear in the things that was difficult. Instead of connecting to the three-dimensional five senses, which always connects us to the wilderness story where they wouldn't listen because all they could see was was giants and that they were grasshoppers, what's that tied to? The five physical senses, the unbelief. But he's saying Jesus understood that he was in a three-dimensional experience right here, but he was living from a five-dimensional space. 
He was living from a space that allowed him to transcend the five physical senses where he was hearing something, even though it was tapping on his physical senses, he was hearing something above that. And that's, what it's, that, that's why I believe it was saying that he overcame, that, that he was delivered from death. Now, okay, we could say, well, resurrection delivered him from death, right? We can say, well, when he was resurrected, he was delivered from death. But it said he was delivered from death, and I'm just like, he was delivered from death. He transitioned away from three-dimensional death. His submitting to the voice moved him into a space where he was not ruled by that. Resurrection came. And this is, a, this is going to tie back to... This is what I love about the Jonah story. When Jesus told the, the, the Pharisees, he said this. He told the Pharisees this. He said, I'm not going to give you, a wicked generation, a sign except for the sign of Jonah, which is incredible to me. It's like the sign of Jonah. Wow, okay. He's going to... Okay, and this is what he meant. Three days... Jonah was at three days in the belly of the whale, right? Or the belly of the whale, not whale, but whale. And three days in the whale, he was spit up, and it was a sign of the of death, burial, and resurrection. That's the only sign they were going to get. But I tell you, there was a greater sign than that along with it. Because what he was saying was, this is, this is, this is the real sign that you are also resurrected. Mm-hmm. And beyond that, What's the story? What is the story of Jonah? Jonah didn't want to go to a people that he believed didn't deserve what God has for them, that they were evil and that they were the enemies of Israel and the enemies of God, and God loved them anyways. That God pushed past Jonah's bias and belief system that God would not and could not do that for people, and he's, he's pushing against it, and he's saying, no, I'm more graceful, I'm more inclusive, I'm more loving than you ever believed. That's the sign of Jonah. And Jesus is demonstrating that sign. And that sign of Jonah is still functioning in us today, always pushing against the limitations of what we're willing to love and who we think God is for. So, in Hebrews, I'm trying to get it by memory, it talks about spiritual and you know, the mature and the immature. And he said that y'all are immature because where you should be professors, mm-hmm. in that you're still talking about doctrine, the form. You're still talking about the form. You're fighting over form, you're fighting over density, you're fighting over three dimensional. You're fighting over teachings and doctrines and theologies. You're fighting about the religion about Jesus instead of living in the religion of Jesus. You're fighting about those things. He says you have not taken in the mature food where you've had your spiritual senses exercised. In in the New King James, it says you're unskillful in the use of your spiritual senses, which is interesting to me because that tells me there is a capacity within humanity to develop in their senses of spiritual, of the senses of the spirit. And he says you're unskillful in that not being able to discern good and evil. And I consulted with Sheila on this. I said, what is the Aramaic for good and evil. And I love this. Oh, man. It's the, it's the idea of something, if it's good versus evil, means it's in just the right moment of ripeness. Meaning, if it's too early, it would be, it would be too, too unripe. If it's too late, it's already in decay. It's, it's right in that space where you're perfectly in sync That's the idea. You're in sync with the time and space in which is the perfect. And the idea of evil is unripe, meaning it's not ripe. It's not not in the right in syncness. And it means to be in sync. So when we think of good and evil, we're thinking, yeah, that's good, that's evil. Yeah, that's evil behavior. It's not talking about that. It's talking about 
a, a person being able to hear that voice and be in sync with divine presence so that you're in the state of righteousness. Okay, Yo, that went over you. We think of righteousness in the theological concept and uh, 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 construct of right standing with God. Do we not? Right standing with God. Righteousness is the right standing of God that was imputed to you because of Christ. I wouldn't say that's wrong, but, but how I understand that, when he says you have yet to be pierced with the revelation, which is the, the Greek word apocalypsis, which means to unveil or uncover a reality and an understanding of a state of being in which you are in that in syncness. Yeah. You are in sync with the divine. You know how to enter into the in syncness of divine. Listen, if you're unskillful in the things of righteousness, it's okay if you're out of sync. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. You'll live. It's going to be fine. God's going to work with you. God loves you. That never changes, but you're going to experience the fruit of what it feels like to be out of sync. Right. Are y'all following me with that? Yes. You better be. I was about to preach harder. <laughs> Can I bring some science? Yeah. I haven't brought science yet. A different discipline. Anthropology. Okay, here's science. So I try to relate this too with what we're understanding about consciousness and what we're understanding about the quantum realm. Okay? So, so, so the three-dimensional five senses holds us here in this dimension. It grounds us to this dimension and to the, the level of your need to survive, your level of anxiety and fear will determine the density in which you exist in the three-dimensional. And the survival mechanisms makes you tied even further to the five senses because you're trying to make yourself safe. In the quantum realm, there is no time, literally speaking. It's, it's an eternal space. Um, so you think, well, what is con? con okay. Everything that we see, I'm going to break it down again for like, well, like I've never told you before, or no one's ever talked about. It. Everything that you see in the, in the three dimensional world is made up of atoms. Once you get down to that small of a, of a, of a thing, it's called quantum, or, or it's, it's, it's based off the word packets of energy. So once you get into the atomic world and the subatomic world, which is the parts and particles of, of atoms and the smallness of it, it does not work off of Newtonian physics. It's unpredictable, it's uncertain, and, and, and it's... Supernatural. In a, it is, and everything that we experience in our physical world is experienced through the building blocks of atoms that functions in, in, in rules that do not exist in our Newtonian world. They just don't. They, they know that atoms can be both waves and particles at the same time. They can be two different things at the same time. And they know that atoms can appear and disappear in different locations without ever having traveled the distance. So when I talked about me being here in three dimension, if I want to go to the, the foyer out there, if they asked me to go to the foyer, I'm just going to take me some time to get there, and I have to actually do that. In the, in the subatomic world, which is five-dimensional, it just has to appear. It doesn't travel it. I don't know what that means. It just doesn't travel it, but it appears and reappears in reality. Yeah. What did you say? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I've never watched Harry Potter, but that sounds good. That's, you realize you watch Harry Potter, you'll need deliverance. Okay. Yeah, there you go. 
so, so, so what, I'm, what, I'm trying to, what am I trying to say in this? What I'm trying to say in this is this is where what Elba talked about earlier is where the quantum field is. It's an intelligence. It's an intelligence that has the capability of creating endless possibilities. Yeah. It is the place where anything can emerge from it. It is the place where there is no limitations. It's non-local, meaning that it doesn't have a particular location because it's everywhere. And it's everything that we are existing in. What makes reality reality is what they would call the observation, which is the collapse of the waveform into a particle, which then creates reality. This is, this is why they talk about law of attraction, <clears throat> being attracting your reality, because what they're saying is, is if you can get the right frequency happening, what will end up happening is, is the, the physical three-dimensional realm will collapse and begin to formulate that reality for you. But it will not do it because you want it to happen. There has to be some things come into place. So Joe Dispenza teaches this. This is incredible stuff. He, he, he talks about how the thoughts are the electric charge into the quantum field. The emotions is the magnetic charge that draws back to you. So whatever thought is being released and emotion is being released is what is being put out and what is being drawn back. And it creates it. So this is what would happen. Within the human, <clears throat> there is an invisible but real detectable phenomenon called electromagnetic field that, that emanates from every human being that looks like an apple. It's from your chakras, actually. Your chakras come up and through from the heart, and it comes out like an apple shape that comes out to about three, sometimes six feet from your body, and it's an electromagnetic field. Guess what's in that field? Information. What information? Information of frequency and vibration of whether you are in a creative state for your life well, you're creating whether you want to or not. You are creating. Everything we're experiencing in our lives, we have created on some level. So, what we have to do with our electro electromagnetic field is we have to start to put in the field what we're actually wanting to create. Okay, you can say, you can say, I want to create a great future for my life, but you have anger, you have resentment, you have, you know, you have fear, you have all the anxiety, you have all these different things, and then say, I want to, I want to create my future, it will not happen because it's not a vibrational match. The law of, of attraction is the law of vibration. And, 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 and if this is correct, we are creating our vibrational frequency. And if you want a different creation, we're co-creating with this divineness, whatever this is, what we're engaging with. We're creating with it, but it's waiting on us. It's kind of like uh, uh, Nathan was saying from a different perspective. He's saying, if you want it, God will let you have it. it. It's yours. You can have it. That's what you want. Your life can be exactly what you want. It exactly is. How, how, what is the quickest and best way to start to create? The best way and the quickest way is to reach a state of pure consciousness. Because pure consciousness allows for the, the magnetic field to repair or to cleanse or to, to create from that space of observation that is in alignment with your truest, best, and your good. And so then we get to experience differently. And I think Jesus experienced this. Okay, okay. before I turn this over to Tammy, I want you all to think about this. 
no, you cannot have my board until I'm done. I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> so, okay, remember this story? You guys will remember this. You all, you all were taught this in faith churches. I, I'm sure I taught it. I'm sure I did. I know I did. Sorry. <laughs> um, they were... The disciples were going somewhere, I think maybe to the temple or something, and they, they, they happened upon the fig tree. And there's more going on to this story. There's, it's a, there's a lot going on to this story. And they walk up to the fig tree, and the, the tree wasn't in season, which I found kind of weird. But anyways, that, I think that goes with the other meanings that it's talking about. And Jesus cursed it. He, he, he spoke to it and said, this, curse, this tree is cursed. The disciples are going, Jesus having a bad day or what? Okay, I don't say nothing. So they go on, and they come back through, and Peter goes, Lord, the tree you cursed has dried up from the roots. What did Jesus say? Have the faith of God. And then whatever you say, you'll get. Because if you say to this mountain, be removed, it'll be cast into the sea. Well, he's using that as a hyperbole, right? It's not literally a, ma- a mountain, but he's talking that, about something. And so he's saying, cast into the sea. But if... If you have unforgiveness in your heart, you will not be forgiven. Your Father in heaven will not forgive you. I'm thinking, what? What in the world is going on? So, okay, let's think about this from a quantum physics perspective. Jesus' thoughts and desire was a vibrational match to a behavior activation, which was he spoke. And when he spoke... It had power because it was a behavioral and and vibrational match to what he was inside and what he was saying. And it happened. And he says, have the faith of God. And I've come to think about the faith of God as not belief per se, but a, a state of... I'm overusing consciousness here. It's a state of consciousness in which you are in that righteousness space in sync and it's a space in which he can now say, and things happen. Okay, that's how, I'm just hypothesizing there. So he says, but if you have, un, but if you have like unforgiveness, you know, you better get that right because your, your heavenly father won't forgive you. Are you telling me that if I don't forgive somebody, God's not going to forgive me? So he, here's what I want us to think about. What he's saying is, is you will not be able to create the reality as long as that frequency is in you. Forgiveness is not about, hey, you did wrong and you need to ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness means to loose energetically from something you've bound yourself to. And so if you've in your heart have unforgiveness, what it means is your energy is bound to density. To this, this space, the earth space, density. If you are bound to it until you release it, that space within yourself, consciousness, Father, will not be able to release you because you have bound yourself to it. So it's a release. You're releasing yourself from energetically when you, when you release. Is that okay? I know I sound a little new, new agey and whatnot and everything. You know what I'm saying? So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Tammy make it more practical. Just take it a little bit deeper, Okay. So I'm going to sit down. Y'all can, y'all can all be happy about that. And, um, we're through playing now. Thank you. Uh, this is on. Can you hear me? Okay. Everybody say this with me. My life is unfolding as it should. That's right. It is. So that's a grounding quote. So when you need grounded, remember that quote. Okay. Um, so during our uh, time earlier when Eddie had us meditating, I wanted to share what I saw. So um, I... Uh, I saw the, in meditation, I saw the feminine, the divine feminine, because that's what I've been working with, is the femininity energy. Um, So I saw the divine feminine God part of us, and I call her Sophia, which is wisdom, 
Um, and so anyway, as I was experiencing her, um, I saw behind her a host of people. And I said, I asked her, I said, what is this host? She said, they're here to learn from you. You guys, they're here to learn from us. And I said, what are they here to learn? They're here to learn how to, be, how to live from consciousness. So guys, that's what it's, this is all tying into, is we're here to live consciously, right? So um, I want to read you a quote. We can't have a healthy outer world without first having a healthy inner world. So a few years ago, well, I'll just say last summer, I would have said I had a pretty healthy inner world, okay, until I got slammed <laughs> with something that God's totally using in my life. Um, and, uh, you know, so in 2000, I'll tell you guys a story. Um, I had a dream in 2000. My son was born in 1999. So in 2000, I had a dream. And in the dream, um, this being, I'm going to say it was a being, um, it looked like an angel, okay, um, came down, and it started out with like a little light, and as the light kept getting closer and closer to me, then I realized it was this being, this angel. I'm going to say it was an angel. I don't really know what it was. It was what, you know, Moses said, God said, I'm going to put you behind a rock because you can't handle seeing this. It was this being, whatever it was, it was magnificent, it was majestic, but it was also terrifying. Because, but it was in a good way. Um, but it gave me a message, and it said that God had sent it to give me a message. And the message was that I was going to birth another child. Well, I knew that wasn't a physical child because we couldn't have any more kids, so... Um, I was, I had my last one in 1999. So anyway, so this last summer, um, I had a health situation come up and a health challenge is really a scary thing. Um, and so, um, I'll just tell you, I had a, um, a tumor found in my breast. And so, um, anyways, um, I had to go and have surgery and all this and stuff. Um, but God told me, he said, you're, this is what I was talking about. He said, you're birthing your true self. And so I knew, he said, the dream you had, this is that. Which is, took 22 years later. But it's a birthing of us. It's a birthing of our true selves. And... Um, and it's been, it's, I mean, it's the most challenging thing I've ever been through. I'll tell you that. In my entire life, the most challenging. But it has also been the most growing time in my life. And I live from this quote, my life is unfolding as it should. I live from that. Um, and so um, I drew this up here because... I've actually been going through this therapy myself. It's called, I call it, I'm going to call it compassion self-therapy. Um, it's called internal family systems. But anyway, so how it works is the core God self, okay? Um, oh, yeah, one thing I was going to tell you. So separation, which is what causes disharmony in our lives. So Separation is um, fear because it always creates separation, right? Okay? The only way to fix separation, which you can't fix it, which is why God told me you can't fix separation, you got to heal it. And that's what I've been doing in my life, is I've been healing my separation. I didn't realize I had separation. I would have said I was completely whole. And I am in my, in my Christ essence and consciousness. But in, my, in parts of me, there was a separation. And so what separation is, is what they call exiles, okay? So that is fear, shame, self-doubt, those kinds of things. And then there's the protectors, okay? And the protectors are 
the things that we put out there to protect the exiles. Okay? The exiles are hidden away. They're in the dark. You can't find them. Okay? The protectors are the ones that you experience. So when you start to see the protectors, such as control, like he was talking about scapegoating, anger, okay? Those things, when you start to experience your protectors, then you know that they're protecting something. And that's what this is. They're exiles. And they're in the dark, okay? And so the only way to heal the separation is through the compassionate part of you. Okay, and that is your God core self. And when you bring the God core self into these, then you can heal it. So a lot of times, like, I'll, things will trigger me, like things will come up, and it's pretty much daily, <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, and so I get triggered. And so I actually talk to my parts. And if it's a protector part, I'll go... And this is how I talk to it. I'll go, I'll, I'll see it, and I'll go, it's okay. I'm here with you. Everything is fine. You're going to be okay. It's okay to give me space. So I'm asking you to kindly give me some space. I talk to it with compassion, total compassion and love. And I ask it to totally, I say, just give me some space. And I just love on it. I love on it. And then if this is coming up, I love on it. And I ask it to give me some space. It's okay to step back. Give me some space. And I'm telling you, it has transformed everything for me. Everything. Um, And it's, it's, I mean, it's just because of the God within. We all have it. Okay. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to read you guys. I'm going to tell you some stuff. So I'm not going to read the scripture, but John 4. Okay. So, um. My water. This is my, uh, which is one of my favorite passages. So, Jesus met up with a woman at a well, and this is the case for God within. Okay? So, when he met the woman, he was giving her a case for why God is going to be within, right? It's multi dimensional. And so he met this woman at the well. He went to Samaria. He went there on purpose in the middle of the day because he knew this woman would be there. Okay? Because this woman had some exiles. She had some shame. You know, she went there in the heat of the day. Most of the women went there in the morning when it was cool. She went there in the heat of the day because she'd been judged. She had had, there had been biasness against her. There had been prejudice against her. She was hurt, and she was upset, and she was angry. And so she went to the well during that time of the day. And so he shows up there, and he says, you know, he says, woman, can I have a drink? And she's like, well, how dare you ask me for a drink? You're a Jew. And not only that, I'm a Samaritan woman here, you know. And he's like, well, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for a drink. And she's like, oh, really? And he said, because what I have is living water, and you will never thirst again. Which is this, the living water. And um, and so then, you know, they go on and they talk. And she's like, so you're saying, you know, you Jews, you worship at the temple. You know, you think you're better than us. And you won't even allow us to go to your temple and worship in Jerusalem. And... um, and so, and then she starts talking about, and you know, you, this is the well of Jacob, you know, which is, you know, he was a mighty man. And this is where we worship here. We worship on this mountain. And so Jesus said, um, well, I will tell you this, the true God, you will worship him in spirit and in truth, which I'm probably butchering the story. I'm not even um, reading it word for word, but I'm just telling you overview of it but anyway so what Jesus was talking about spirit and truth so what that is is to awaken to the Christ within that's what he was talking about so but I want to break those apart okay when I read you this spirit is to become your true self 
Connecting to the Christ consciousness is to tr connect to your true source, to get in right relationship with yourself, which always boils down to love. Cosmic love and heart alchemy, which I love your alchemy shirts because I've been studying heart alchemy. Heart alchemy is this, oneness with spirit. Okay? Um, and so we're all connected to the spirit that pulsates through everything, guys. It's in everything. It pulsates through everything. So, okay, and then truth, this is another thing. So truth is wisdom, okay? So it's you are more than you think you are, okay? You are meant to live a fulfilling life. You're meant to, right? We're meant to. And so, you know, like the husband that she said, he said, go and call your husband. She said, well, you know, the man I'm with right now is not, he's, well, he tells her, the man you're with right now is not your husband. Um, and so, but she's tried to define her life from the things outside of her, right? And we, have, we can't find the fulfillment of ourselves by looking without. Um, so Jacob's well, which is, you know who Jacob is, right? You guys all know the story. If you don't, I encourage you to find it and read it. But he's, the name Jacob means trickster, okay? So um, basically what the well represented is a lower perspective. So basically what they were worshiping and drawing from that well, that well metaphorically means a lower perspective, Okay, so they were living from a lower perspective when they didn't know about this living water, right? That he was talking about a living water, a love. Um, and so he was talking about a face to face love and encounter, a kiss from the Christ within, right? That's what you do when you're healing, healing yourself with your core self of the God image in you as you are being kissed by the Christ consciousness. New life within you to discover and explore consciousness. Christ, the original intent of our lives. Christ within, all things restored. The water in the story represents returning to source. Our source, our true source. Um, so this is why it's bigger than any religion. It's bigger than any religion, and it's universal. It really is. It's universal. Um, and we are the mystery. We're the mystery. We're here to live it out. You, Eddie was, or somebody was talking about living from the unknown. We are the mystery. We are the unknown, becoming known, right? Learning how to live from consciousness. That's becoming known, living from an unknown place. So I want to read you guys the definition. Oh, first I want to tell you about this. Um, so um, this, like I said, I was about to have surgery, and I was going through a really, really rough time. Uh, and I was driving to Oklahoma City to one of my appointments. And um, as I was driving, I was having a panic attack. Um, and so I was dealing with my fear, dealing with my, you know, and... Um, and God said, he said, I'm deeper than the well of your fear. He said, when you get to the bottom of that well of fear you got in you, you're going to find me at the bottom. I'm, I'm down there. And you're not by yourself. And in the minute that happened, I'm not kidding you guys. This was, this was a phenomenon. I am not kidding. My car has a sunroof. And the moment he told me that, my sunroof just shattered out of nowhere. Now, I'm telling you, nothing hit it. Nothing, not a bird, not a rock. There was nobody in front of me or behind me. I mean, it just, out of nowhere, it just shattered. And God said, I'm shattering your fear. I'm, take, I'm, I'm letting you loose. Because you're going to come into your true self. I'm letting you loose. I'm breaking this free. Um, and so, anyway, so I'm going to read you guys what is spirituality. I have a definition, okay? To 
Okay. What is spirituality? At its core is knowing yourself better, understanding who you are, having greater control over thoughts, emotions, speech, and actions. To be aware of all that life is changing. Be aware that all of life is changing. Seeing the world through the eyes of compassion, accepting yourself as we are caring for others, releasing negativity and mental states such as fear, anger, jealousy, and self-doubt. You know what self-doubt does? It makes you compare yourself. The reason why you compare yourself is because you don't trust yourself. And it's because you don't know that. That. When you know that and this compassion and you're healing this, then you won't have a lack of confidence. Everybody around you will say, man, she's so confident. He's so confident. You know, you're not going to, they're going to encounter something different from you. There's a different energy about you, right? A higher energy. So to know yourself is to know God. To love yourself is to love God. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. True spirituality develops inner peace, balance, and harmony. So I'm going to give you three spiritual practices that are tools for your toolbox. Okay? There's actually eight, but I'm going to... There we go. Okay. Number one. And I'm going to tell you what each one of these do, okay? Mindfulness is being aware of yourself and the world around you. It's heart-centered awareness. It develops wisdom and insight. You want more wisdom and insight? Practice mindfulness, okay? Um, So to be able to live according to truth. So here's mindfulness. There's several ways you can do it, okay? Okay. I'm just giving you my favorites, okay? Um, I love nature, okay? I love nature. I love to get out in nature. I love to watch birds. I like to sit and listen to nature. I like to listen to the trees. I like to look at the trees. I like to touch the trees. Um, I've even gone up to a tree and said, tree, release your healing energy into me. Because that tree is powerful and it's been here for hundreds of years. I want to know your secrets. Right? I've even done that. Um, So mindful eating. That means when you're eating, to be mindful of eating. Not just, you know, eating and just like you're, you're checked out, but you're just eating. So thinking about your eating. You know, watching yourself. Um, body scans. How many of you heard of body scans? Okay. So body scans is closing your eyes, and that's part of some of this that I do with my therapy, and I do it with my clients that I work with, is I'll have them close their eyes, and I'll say, okay, where do you feel that emotion, these, in your body? Where do you feel it? Because the body is what holds the emotions, right? So where do you feel it at in your body? And that's where we'll start to work with is right there. So if they feel it, they say, oh, I feel it in my stomach. Then we'll start to be mindful of that area of their body. And we'll look at what's operating there, okay? What emotion is operating there or what, you know, what protector might be operating there. And then we'll bring in our core self, okay? Our core God self. Um, And so... That's mindfulness. Number two is practice gratitude. Okay? So the practice of gratitude is the ability to let things go. When you practice gratitude, you're letting the negativity go. Okay? Because you're pulling in positivity. You're pulling in the things that a new perspective, right? So you're letting those old perspectives go. Number three, or actually I have four, and number three is breath work, okay? So the breath work, how many of you know about breath work? Right? We did it today, right? Um, Means to calm the mind. That's what breath work does. 
It brings stillness. Now, do you want to develop self-compassion? Breathing is it, okay? Breathing is a way for you to develop self-compassion. Um, can, because the reason why is you're connecting to your body, okay? And that's where Jared mentioned the chakra healing, all right? So that's a, also a part of using your breath. Number four, meditate, okay? And meditation is to see in other dimensions, to develop wisdom and to embody the God nature. So you become your answer to yourself as you connect to source. You want your prayers answered? You're the answer. Yeah. You are the answer to your prayers. So when you connect to source in meditation and prayer, you're answering your own prayers because you're connecting to your God core self to help heal these. Um, okay. Also, meditation is a way to deal with old, outdated mindsets and to restore right-mindedness of Christ, to heal the mind, and to wake up your true potential and power. Why is this important for us moving forward? Okay. So, I wrote up here the definition of multidimensional. Okay. So, what we're doing in moving forward is we are with God in heavenly places and in God on the earth simultaneously. This is the consciousness, guys, right here, is living with God in heavenly places. That means you're not just here on earth right now. You're also in heaven right now. Right now, you're in heaven and in the earth simultaneously. That's consciousness, okay? Um, so I'm going to read you guys something that I wrote about multidimensional. All right. We are multidimensional beings, an ability to dance with the light and the dark. Why? Why would we dance with the dark? Just take a look at Jesus' life. He brought a collision with light and darkness. The shadow part of Adam and the true self we call the God part. This is what the cross was all about. It's the process of surrendering our darkest parts of us to the light. It has to be done with compassion, understanding, and acceptance for it to truly work. If you feel triggered in yourself with tendencies and reactions, then you're on the right track to the deepest parts of you that you need healed. This is, this is you are beginning to see the bottom of your well of fear. It's time to shed the light on the shadows so you can change it. Okay? Okay. Awakening is this. We are, okay, so I, I drew it up here. This, okay? That is a representation of what we're moving towards. We're moving towards one Christ loving itself. Okay, do you guys get that? One Christ loving itself. And I said itself because it's not a gender. Okay? Here's the other part that we're moving towards, and Sheila really hit it this morning. What has created divine mirroring is we're here to encounter divine mirroring. So here's what created it. The dance of Christ and Adam coming together, the light and dark, which is all useful. And as, you know, Jesus resurrected, what did he do? He placed us in the Trinity. So we're in the Trinity, in the dance of the Trinity. So um, here's what divine mirroring is. When we can see con con contemplatively, everything in the universe is a mirror. Okay? So when you can look at yourself, your life, with contemplation, okay, that's being aware of this contemplation so that you can heal these things, and bring compassion to it. See, you can't, you can't just try to get free of this by going, oh, I'm not going to live that way. Because you know what? You will. It comes up. I'm telling you. <laughs> it comes up. It has a way of bubbling up, and it will come out in your life. It will come out in your relationships. It will come out in your, uh, you know, your job. It will come out some way with your kids. I guarantee you, it will come up and come out. 
So you have to deal with it, and you have to use compassion to do it. So, to see from a perspective of love and seeing true beauty. All love, goodness, and holiness is a reflected gift. Total liberation of love and self-acceptance. Um, so, to see self from the perspective of love and compassion, then creation is reflecting back to you the inner core self, which is the life of the Trinity. Okay. Yes. So I loved what Eddie said this morning. He said, you, you're, this is a time of responsibility, right? And you're exactly right. This is, it's our responsibility, guys. This is a one-person job. No one else can do it for us. We have to do it for ourselves. And it is a time of responsibility, being willing to let chaos Create the true inner beauty. Chaos is beautiful. I no longer resist it. It's beautiful. Because it's creating a different kind of beauty, right? What you create on the inside always starts to show on the outside. So be mindful that you're living from that. So that's all I have. I saw you teaching before you guys ever came because of where she is. And listen, you're getting more than you realize, okay? You're just taking it in. I know it's a lot of information, but it's coming in waves, and it is all interconnected, like you said. Do you want to do it or not? Okay. Um, so you're getting more than you realize, plus you can listen to it again. But when someone is speaking out of... Um, Intellect, it's one thing, it's another thing when someone's speaking out of where they are and experience, then there's an impartation. I just wanted to share this real quickly to piggyback off of what Tammy was speaking on, it being your responsibility. Um, I had a, a vision while I was actually driving, which I don't know how safe that is, but I'm in a meditative state because I was driving the same road you always drive. And I was listening to that song Rescue by Lauren Dingle, Daigle. And... It's all about sending the armies out to rescue you, to find you in your darkest time and your darkest need. And I saw myself in the fetal position in the woods, just beaten up, black and blue, just hurting, just grief, pain, all these things that were going on right now in my life, just, just in it. And as I looked up and I saw someone coming to rescue me, and I just watched the movie Redeeming Love. I don't know if y'all have seen that. I was like crying like a baby. Um, and it's basically, Redeeming Love is a movie about Hosea, basically, um, and his wife, the prostitute. <laughs> and um, so I'm in the woods, I'm in the fetal position, and I'm waiting to be rescued. And um, I was a 90s baby, so I watched lots of princess movies where the prince came to rescue you. <laughs> and that was a very strong belief in me. I was waiting to be rescued from situations. And that probably looked a lot like my father in the past, and he did rescue me in a lot of situations that I put myself in. And so with eliminating that form of him in my life, it's left kind of this major anxiety of just facing everyday life and waiting for someone to come. And so I'm in the woods, and I'm in the fetal position. I look up, and I see this woman, and she's trudging through mud, and it's up to here, and she had mud all in her hair, and she was dressed like a warrior would have been dressed. And you just saw this look on her. And she's just like tearing through. And I couldn't really see her because I couldn't see through my eyes. And when she got to me, she grabbed my face and she said, I'll always rescue you. I looked up and it was me. And who I've been waiting for the whole time, that unconditional love I was waiting for to rescue me out of this situation was myself. <laughs> And she held, she picked me up like a baby, but I was a grown woman. And she held me, and then she looked at me, and she opened my mouth, and she breathed into me. And she said, I'm the unconditional love you're looking for. 
And so that responsibility, that person you're waiting for, what you're looking for in that situation that's painful is yourself. The unconditional love you're wanting is, is from that, that higher self. And I knew that she was a warrior and I knew she was singing that song to me. And so I just wanted to share that real quick. Now, and this may be a little, this is also tagging on and diving in a little bit. I think some of the experiences people are having, a, a lot of them people are having, you're encountering yourself because your your mind can't, uh, I just got out of the bathroom for like five minutes so somebody just said this, just stop me, but your mind couldn't handle encountering yourself. So you, a, a being comes to you to help you. It is your your pure self saying we're going to we're going to become this together you're 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 becoming and so many times we do encounter others but a lot of times it's you helping you and I, and I believed it to be true before I and then you know scripture whatever but the prodigal son it says he was looking at the pig slop and desiring to eat with the pigs and he came to himself. And he didn't just come to his right mind, but there was a self that said, hey, you don't eat that. And the self convinced him, the higher self convinced that self at least to get down the road to where he could. Didn't tell him the whole story at the pig slop, but said, hey, go back to dad's. There's at least food there. He's good with the servants. And it helped him pull, pull him up into that to that place. So good. So good. That's that's the um, responsibility is the maturing in the body of Christ. Us looking for the, the sky God to come and do something else when he finished it is the immature state. And it's beautiful. And I'm excited and thrilled and honored to watch you guys come out of the closet. <laughs> so what we're going to do, we have about 15 minutes. We're going to let the band come up. We're going to get just really drunk and wasted with presence and release it. What I'm going to ask you guys to do for about those 15 minutes is to help us clean up. Okay? Like go check the guy's bathroom, toilet paper, check, taking out trash, just kind of walk through here. That way when we're done... As it goes, because people will probably leave, um, then we will we'll have most of it done. Does that sound good? All right, let's take 15 minutes. And if you don't have something to do, ask Travis. He'll be in there cleaning a urinal. <laughs>